Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I came in on the tail end of Stephen's presentation there, which uh, was very impressive. So if you're feeling a little overwhelmed by his technology, rest assured you'll feel a lot better after listening to me. Uh, we, we are definitely not that high tech. Um, but uh, <laughs> definitely not that high tech. You're going to see some pictures that prove it. Um, but uh, <laughs> like, like they said, I am from Jefferson. I work with my parents and my brother back there, sort of. Actually, I don't work with him. He never shows up. He <laughs> still has other jobs that keep him busy. Um, but Jefferson's about 45 miles away from here. Uh, we have uh, been on the land for over 100 years, so I'm fourth generation. And uh, started going back and helping my folks out about, oh, eight or nine years ago in 2010. I was a high school math teacher for about 10 years before that. So I'm highly trained in the Apple business with a degree in mathematics and educational administration. <laughs> but uh, this is our main business, or our, I guess I should say our, our primary facility here. It's where all the action happens. Uh, it houses our retail shop, um, our cider press and bottling area, where we sort and pack our apples, and uh, our cold storage. And then recently on the left side there, we built uh, put a little seating area on for about 60 people in a small kitchen. The house on the left is where I grew up and where my parents still live. If we swing around to the other side there, you can kind of see some of our uh, <coughs> orchards that surround the facility. We've got about 45 acres of apple trees. The majority of those are on our semi-dwarf trees. We have some dwarf trees as well, and we still have some old standard trees that are were planted out in the 40s after the arms stay freeze. Uh, and I guess what I'm going to do here is I, I'd just kind of like to give a brief kind of backdrop of what our business looks like so you can kind of understand the different things we do. And then I'll just go through kind of how we got started with hard cider. And hopefully after I'm done, uh, you'll have a basic idea if you want to make your own hard cider, uh, just a kind of a quick, easy way to do that. Um, but uh, you can see in the picture here we've got a parking lot. That parking lot is uh, about... Uh, where, our, where our sweet corn is during the summer. We have about 10 acres of sweet corn that we grow. Beside that is a pumpkin patch. We have about 10 to 12 acres of pumpkins. Uh, you can't see it very well in this picture, but we also have about six to seven acres, I think, of Christmas trees that we do for cut your own Christmas trees. So got a lot of irons in the fire. We're uh, busy all year round, but uh, very hectic from July through end of December. I guess the other main attraction that we have, you can kind of see, uh, yellow and red tarp type object there. That's a bouncy pillow. We have a kind of a family entertainment zone that you can pay admission to get into where you have a lot of activities to keep you busy. The main one, main draw being the bouncy pillow and then also we have a, about a five acre corn maze, I think. And Chris, if I say anything wrong, feel free to correct me. Okay, and that goes really for anybody. If you hear a mistake, <laughs> which I probably will say a few things that you'll shake your head at, feel free to ask questions later and say, I think you're wrong. Say, you're probably right. Um, but uh, give you an idea of where our income comes from, uh, this is from 2017. Uh, you can see about half of our income is from on site sales, half of it is from off site. 40% uh, of our on site sales just are generated through sales in our retail shop. Another 10% from people coming out to uh, get admission into our uh, family entertainment area, or that can also count as concession income as well. And half of it's wholesale, majority of it is um, to grocery stores. We sell a lot of apples and sweet cider uh, to grocery stores, and about 4% comes from farmer's markets. If we take a look at our wholesale amounts, uh, this is where most of our hard cider is sold, is uh, in the wholesale area. We, we do sell on-site as well. But in 2017, about 10% of our wholesale was hard cider. If we looked at 2018, it would probably be closer to 15%. But you can see that really uh, the, the majority of our wholesale, it comes from sweet cider. So we make a lot more sweet cider than we do hard cider right now. Hard cider is gaining a little bit every year, but uh, we probably press about 30,000 gallons of sweet cider if we have a good crop of apples. Uh, so focusing a little bit more on the hard cider, uh, this shows our growth over the years. Our first batch we made was in 2011. Uh, we just made a little bit because we had no idea what we were doing. And I still don't think I have 
<laughs> uh, I still struggle a little bit with what I'm doing sometimes with the hard cider. But uh, as we the years went on, we figured out a little bit more, uh, learned a little bit. Our first big jump, I think, between 2013 and 2014, or at least I felt it was a big jump. I'm sure a lot of people or some people out there are looking at it and thinking that's, that's hardly anything. Um, but I felt it was big. Uh, the main reason we had that was we had received a grant through the USDA uh, called a Value Added Producer Grant. Uh, and when we wrote the grant, one of our goals was to increase our wholesale sales. And so because of that, we jumped up a little bit. And then you can see the next three years were kind of stagnant. We were kind of figuring out what we were doing in those three years of how best to market it. And in 2016, we kind of figured it out that uh, it's better to or easier to sell it to beer or sell it to the bars and local breweries and brew pubs as opposed to trying to sell it to grocery stores by the bottle. So we started selling it by the keg. That helped. And then 2016 to 2017, the other factor that helped uh, increase our production was we uh, came out with a peach flavored hard cider that was uh, well, uh, well received and then had a nice little jump in 2018 as well. But so how did we start? So this <laughs> it's really this right here. Uh, in 2010, uh, I asked for a winemaking kit for Christmas. Uh, I was still teaching high school math at that time, so really I needed something to calm my nerves, and I figured what better way to do it than free alcohol. <laughs> so I wasn't lying when I said we had no idea what we were doing in 2011 when we started making our first batch. That was probably the third time I'd made hard cider when we started selling it. So. <laughs> I made one batch in 2010, it was okay. I made a second batch, it was awful. I made a third batch, still not good, but palatable. Um, and so my dad came up to me and said, oh, th those weren't too bad. Uh, and he still says the same time every time he tastes some cider. He said, oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> I'd say, dad, you say that every time. He's like, well, it is. Um, but uh, he asked me if, how hard was it, and I said, oh, it wasn't too hard to actually make alcohol. I don't know if it was very easy to make good alcohol, but uh, to make the actual alcohol, it wasn't too bad. So he decided he'd make some, and I was making five-gallon batches. He decided he'd make about a 120-gallon batch. <laughs> so uh, we used some just food-grade plastic barrels to ferment it in, which is still what we do. Like I said, you're going to feel really good after this presentation for the technology that we use. Um, so he made 120 gallons, and we still really had no idea what we were doing, so we decided it would be a good idea if we called some people that knew more than we did. So one of the people we asked for a little bit of guidance was a local winery located in Carroll, Iowa called Santa Maria. And they gave us some good tips on um, kind of types of yeast to use, how to uh, put the yeast into it, how to so use sulfite, um, which helped. And then we also called a brewery here in Ames called Old Main Brewing. Uh, they had purchased some sweet cider from us a few years prior to that and had turned it into hard cider. And so we asked them if they had any tips, and they said, well, um, if you just ferment it like the way that you're doing, you're probably going to need a little bit more flavor to it. So they suggested that we back sweeten with some of our sweet cider. So once it's fermented, excuse me, you can put it in a keg or somehow put it in some vessel and then add a little bit of your sweet cider back into it that's going to add some flavor. And then they also suggested um, we could buy a big tank to do that in or we could buy some small kegs. And so we went the cheaper route, the small kegs. We bought some Cornelius kegs like you see there. Um, and we bought a CO2 tank and a regulator. And that was pretty much all we needed to get to the point where we enjoyed the cider that we made. Um, so it wasn't... Uh, terrible amount of work. Uh, we were pretty pretty happy with uh, the small investment that we, we had to make. Um, just really these few things here, and we were kind of on our way. Now, we still had a lot of cider to get rid of, and we couldn't sell it because we weren't licensed. So like I said, this is our high-tech assembly line here. We say, just like Budweiser. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm in the corner there. I've got, you can't really see it in my hand, but we bought a beer gun as well called a Blickman beer gun. Uh, to help fill the bottles. My dad's capping there. Um, but we uh, drank a lot of hard cider that year and gave a lot of it away. And uh, some people started asking, you know, can I buy this? I feel bad just taking it from you all the time without giving you any money. He said, no, you can't. <laughs> that would be illegal. So <laughs> we decided that wasn't a good business plan. So later that year, in um, 2011, we finally got all the paperwork filled out to become legal and start selling it. 
Um, so I guess the next part I'd just like to talk a little bit about some of the questions I had when I first started out. Like I said, I, I really didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I bought a book and uh, talked to a lot of people. Um, but I, really what I'm going to do is go through just some questions that I had and maybe you might have if you're looking to make your own. Um, but one of the first things you have to decide is what, what kind of apples do you want to use in the hard cider. Um, and in a, most orchards right now in the United States probably just have mostly dessert apples. There's a lot that are starting to plan out uh, the heirloom varieties that are meant specifically for hard cider. I think Paul will probably talk a little bit about that. Maybe Deirdre will too. Uh, we don't have any of those. So a lot of the recommendations for those more traditional ciders we couldn't really follow. Uh, this one, kind of the astringent apple there, you could use crab apples or wild apples, which we don't really have access to. Uh, so that was, that was the recommendation from the book, and I followed it a little bit. Um, but really what happens with us is we just kind of use what we have. And the, so our blend is composed mainly of Jonathan, Yellow Delicious, Red Delicious, Honeycrisp, Chieftain, Harrelson, or Empire. Those are our probably most prolific varieties that we grow or that we have the most of. And we really just try and balance sweet and tart when we're making it and try and at least make it equal. And if it needs to be a little uh, higher ratio of one, we always choose to make it more tart than sweet. If you have too much sweet, it's just going to be a little bit bland. All right, so there's a quick list of all the varieties that we grow. We probably grow close to 30. Some of those are trees that aren't quite ready yet. We just planted out a few years ago, and the deer seem to be giving us problems with getting them developed. So Evercrisp and Granny Smith, we've got a few rows of those out, but they just don't want to get to the point where we can pick them. And the ones in red, like I said, are the ones that we have the most, uh, most quantities of. So Jonathan and Harrelson are, are the apples that we most often use to kind of get that tart flavor in the cider that we're looking for. Uh, here's a shot of uh, one of our harvests. This is, uh, we pick into bulk bins. Uh, six, those hold about 16 bushel. And this is our sorting equipment. <laughs> no computer necessary. <laughs> this, is, this picture was from 1985. And if you went there today, you'd still take the same picture. <laughs> Except it wouldn't look quite as nice. The green is worn off a little bit. And so is the orange there. But uh, that's what our sorting line looks like. Um, really, I think if you're looking to make your own hard cider, probably the biggest hurdle you might have to clear is finding a, a press. So we have a rack and cloth press shown here. I think, Chris, is that 150 gallons an hour we can make? Do you remember? Does that sound right? Okay. Um, so obviously, if you're looking to make your own just for a home, home brewer or a home winemaker, you won't need that big of press. Um, but I think maybe a kind of a personal press might be five or six hundred dollars you can buy one for. I'm not, not certain, but... Definitely not that big. You don't need one that large. There's a shot of it in action. Cider getting squeezed out. Um, so after you've pressed the juice, the next step is you need to ferment it. So when we start fermentation, I guess the first question we had to answer for ourselves is do we want to ferment with the natural yeasts that are found on the apples or do we want to add our own yeast? And we decided to kill off the natural yeast. Sometimes it works great. Other times uh, you can get off flavors just depending on the strain of yeast that's out there. So we add a little bit of potassium uh, metabisulfite to kill the yeast and then we'll add our own yeast. Um, when uh, the other thing to consider when you're starting the fermentation process is what is your end goal for your alcohol volume? We like a finished product of about 6.9% ABV is what we're shooting for in most of our ciders. So that usually requires us to add a little bit of sugar for the fermentation process, for those of you unfamiliar with it. Uh, fermentation is the act of the yeast eating the natural sugars or the sugar that you add and turning it into alcohol or um, carbon and carbon dioxide. So that's, that's about as much I know about the chemistry. Um, that's one of those things when I was a math teacher, I tried to tell my kids, I want you to understand why you're doing it, how to do it, and what to do it. But at the very least, understand what to do. So on some of the hard cider stuff, I don't understand the why or the how, but I know what to do. And that's one of those cases. I, I don't understand the chemistry very much. Um, but one thing that you will need is a, a piece of equipment is a hydrometer. And that is pretty much, if you've never seen one, it's just a bobber that you place in your juice. And it measures the density of that juice. And that tells you how much sugar is in there. And uh, I think that they, we've got a handout that will be coming. If not, you might already have it. Of 
already got it, all right. That has uh, different websites you can go to for calculators. You can take your hydrometer reading, type it into that website, and it'll tell you how much sugar you can add based on how much volume you have of your juice. Um, so the other thing, uh, for fermentation, when you add the yeast, you want to wait at least 24 hours uh, after if you added sulfite to kill the natural yeast. You don't want to put your store-bought yeast in there right away, otherwise it'll kill that too. So we wait about 24 hours before adding the yeast. Uh, we use granular yeast. Uh, so you can also use yeast that comes in liquid form. Um, we just use the granular. There's a few examples up there of some ones that I use. Uh, when you start the yeast, you activate it with warm water. And then before you add it to your juice, you want to make sure that the temperature of your activated yeast and the temperature of your juice are in about 5 degrees, uh, 5 to 10 degrees of uh, within one another. If you have too big of a gap, you're going to shock the yeast and kill it. So I think I've done that. Or One of the times I made a, a very bad batch of ciders because I killed the yeast and my cider sat there unfermenting for a while before I realized it and tried to add some more yeast. It didn't work too well. But after the yeast is added, it'll ferment, hopefully, if you did everything right. And the fermentation period really varies on a, a few things. One is the temperature that you're fermenting at. We just ferment at room temperature. So if it's 70 degrees, it's going to go really fast. It'll take maybe a week, week and a half. Sometimes it's 50 degrees where we're fermenting, so it can take two to three months at that time. The other thing is how much sugar is the yeast eating. The more sugar, the longer it might take to ferment. Um, after it's done fermenting, uh, you can test it with your uh, hydrometer and place it in there and it'll sink lower all the way down because there's not as much sugar in there to hold it up. Uh, if uh, it's done fermenting, it's also done bubbling usually, so that's the easy way to realize if you need to test it or you want to test it. After it's done, we'll usually rack it to a new barrel, which means we take it out of that old barrel that's had the settlings in it and we'll transfer it over to a new one. Uh, it's nice and clean and sanitized, and then we place it in our walk-in cooler and allow it to sit for at least a week, maybe more. Uh, oh, here comes the good stuff. And by letting it sit in that cooler there, uh, it's going to clarify the hard cider a little bit more. And uh, like I said, w w I like to let it sit at least a week. Um, a lot of the times it sits for longer. Uh, also, like I said, we, we've come out with a few flavors of hard cider. Um, if you want to flavor it, you want to do that probably right before you're going to put your cider in the carbonation tank. So one of the places that we get our flavorings from is GLCC Flavors. It's listed there. It's a company out of Michigan, I believe. Um, the other option uh, is you can, when you ferment your cider, you can put fruit in there and ferment the fruit as well to get a flavoring or an um, have that flavor of the cider. Uh, just one thing that I've learned that uh, if you flavor your hard cider, that changes the or can change the tax classification of it. So if you are getting to the point where you think you want to sell hard cider, if you flavor it, that often changes how you present it to the federal government. So there's our four different varieties that we have. You're trying the pear, so that's 100% pear that you're drinking. Uh, we have about seven or eight pear trees. Uh, on our property, and we take all the the crop from them and press it into the cider there. So I think this year we harvested oh, about 50 bushel or so, and we're able to make about 150 gallons of, of pear cider. Uh, we've got our original cider that we started with. Our first foray into flavoring it was a raspberry, and then final one was the peach. Uh, one of the big things that I wasn't quite sure of how to do was carbonating the cider. After you had fermented it and let it sit for a while and clarified it, I wasn't quite certain on how to get it carbonated. One, one method I know that I read of in the books was called bottle carbon carbonation. So you simply put it in a bottle, you put a little bit more sugar in that bottle, and you seal the bottle. The yeast that's still active in the cider will eat the sugar in the bottle, creating carbon dioxide, and it'll self-carbonate. The problem with that is, is that if you put a little too much sugar in there, you're going to create a little too much carbon dioxide, and you'll get a nice bottle bomb. So I figured that wasn't the best marketing strategy, so I didn't think I wanted to go that route. And the other bad thing about that is, since your yeast is in there eating the sugar, it's stealing all that flavor. So it's a very, when, it, when you say dry, that means there's no sugar in something. If a wine is dry, uh, there's no sugar. So that, that cider 
was dry. So I wanted a little bit sweeter cider, so we decided to go the route of forced carbonation. So we place it into a bright tank is what it's called, or a carbonation tank, and hook up a CO2 tank to it and force carbonate it that way. This is obviously more controlled, and it's also quicker as well. You don't have to wait a few weeks in order to gain uh, that carbonation that you want. Uh, another thing that I found out over the years uh, is that uh, you need to be very careful of how much CO2 is in your cider. If it's over a certain level, you're going to get taxed at a different rate. So if you keep it under, uh, was it 0.684, I believe, grams per 100 milliliters, uh, that's okay. It can be classified as hard cider. And if it's a flavored hard cider, it has to be even lower. Um, to check that, I believe it's pronounced carbon de sewer. I'm not certain, but that is a piece of equipment that you can check the carbonation levels. Uh, so there are some tanks that we purchased for the first few years. We did not have any carbonation tanks We just let our cider sit in those blue barrels uh, with a covering on them We soon found out that you can do that for a month or two, but after that uh, They are a little bit too susceptible to oxygen oxygen getting in there or air getting in there and turning into vinegar So we figured out that was that was bad um, So we've had to dump a, a little bit out uh, once we started getting these tanks and getting them into the tanks as soon as possible, though, we eliminated, eliminated that problem. So here's some more of the equipment that we first started off with. That's what the beer gun looks like. It's called a Blickman beer gun. It costs about $100. Um, that's what I still use sometimes to bottle with. Uh, if I've just got a few bottles to fill, I'll take that out. And then the capper there. Uh, and after a while, though, one fall, my wife was getting a little angry at me for how much time I was spending bottling the hard cider, and she said, you need, need to get a bottler. So listening to the wisdom of my wife, I bought a four-spout bottling system. Really, it's essentially four beer guns on a swivel, but you can, it does let you go a little bit faster. I, um, I guess I haven't been totally pleased with it. There's still problems with carbonation um, when you're filling the bottles, but... Uh, for the most part, it has sped up the process, and I use that um, quite a bit. Uh, like I said a little bit, I touched on marketing the cider was probably one of the major mistakes we made, too, or how we marketed it. Um, when we started off, I just figured that it would be easiest to market it to the Fairways and Hy-Vee stores that we sold to. Um, we, like I said, we said we sold or sell to about 50 to 60 Hy-Vees and Fairways in the central Iowa area. So I just figured they would like to carry our hard cider too, and which many of them agreed to. Was, they said, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, the problem was is that when we did that, the, the cider got placed in their wine and liquor sections amongst thousands of other alcoholic beverages, and no one knew it was there. So uh, we did sell a decent amount, but it just sat there. Um, and so that's luckily Chris saved the day and ran into a friend that was a owner down in the Des Moines area of a beer and he said hey I'm thinking about putting a different hard cider on tap and asked Chris would you like it if I put yours on tap and Chris said I don't know since I never worked there <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we did and I sold more hard cider in one day there than I did in a few weeks at a grocery store so I'm like hmm that's Sounds like a good idea. I think I'll do that instead of bottling. It's a lot easier to keg, and really, the I thought it'd be a major investment to be able to have to keg or to, to put it in sand key kegs, and it wasn't nearly as much investment or time and trouble that I thought it was going to be. So we experienced a lot more uh, success that way, and I, uh, I do not enjoy bottling, um, and I, I prefer to sell it in kegs. But uh, it, it's definitely something we need to sell the bottle or have bottles on hand at our store as well. And obviously not everyone's going to want to take home a five-gallon keg of hard cider. Um, but uh, so that was w uh, one of the learning experiences that we had. The other thing, um, a pretty big mistake I made was when I first registered with the state, I registered as a native winery just because I thought that that's what I had to do because cider is wine technically when you ferment it. I did not realize you could also be classified as a native brewery. Um, the big difference uh, from that is I pay a lot more in taxes when I sell it to wholesale, uh, to grocery stores or bars. So I, I think, let's see, Paul, is it 19 cents a tax for classified as a native brewery per gallon? Do you know? 
We're both. Do you know what, what the tax per gallon is when you sell it to a native brewery, or as a native brewery? As a brewery, I think it's five. Five cents a gallon. So I pay $1.75 a gallon as a native winery. Um, so yes, that when <laughs> at the very beginning, it didn't matter because I, I had no really inclination that I'd be selling it to bars or stores. I just thought we'd sell it at, at the orchard. So I don't have, I don't have a lot of foresight. <laughs> My brother, again, is an engineer, so he does. I'm sure we probably wouldn't have had this problem had he been doing the planning. But uh, that's something that we need to change, so I'm, I'm wasting a lot of money right now selling it as a native winery. Um, and the other thing that you need to be prepared for if you want to sell, start selling it uh, by the glass uh, at your business is you need to have insurance, dram shop insurance. Um, and so that has to be set up in advance. Uh, and then, uh, like I talked about, just what's the best way to package or present your your cider there? Uh, and I guess the main thing that I I kind of ask myself, what, why am I doing this sometimes, um, or what am I most excited about the hard cider uh, besides free alcohol? Is uh, that uh, I, I really enjoy when we have uh, we've started having a few events out at our uh, retail area, or our our farm. Uh, this is a picture of our seating area that we put on, and this is a shot we had a, a kind of a little concert uh, one time in September, and then for Ragbri we hosted a, a kind of a concert during the day when Ragbri was going through town this year, and those are really enjoyable to me just to sit out and talk to people and sit down and have a glass of cider. So that's my favorite part of the business, um, but uh, and what w really the part of business that I hope to grow now. So. I believe that's about it, and I've gone a little bit over time. So, uh, let's see. Do you guys want to just move on to Paul, or do you want? Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. I right. I will. So I will sulfite um, when we rack it off to a new, a clean container. Uh, I will sulfite again to kill that yeast. And then I will also, when we fill a container full of the fresh juice, I'll sulfite that as well. So. So in your, in your license, you ATL? Uh, TTB, I believe. Uh, it's so long ago that I can't quite remember, but I know the TTB is, is the main one that we're, we're going through. I don't think I have to deal anything with ATF. But yeah, that was, I spent a lot of time on the phone with with the TTB because a lot of the forms it's it's not brain or rocket science but it's a lot of the questions like I don't know what they're asking for here like they say list the form number well, I don't know what what do you mean form number so it's and it's just a quick easy well it's it's the year and then what page it is so it's 2018-1 so just just questions like that I looked at I'm like I have no idea how to fill this out so the first few times I did I called someone at the agency and they just kind of walked me through it but yeah that's that was frustrating because hard when we started at hard cider hadn't quite had the explosion yet uh, of popularity and so I would call someone at the TTB and they say well it's under 7% so you're technically not a wine so you have to talk to the FDA and so I'd call the FDA and they say well no you're a wine you have to talk to the TTB so no one knew what they would just pass me off to somebody else so I, I remember being very frustrated that no one really knew what was going on and couldn't answer my questions so I don't know if that's still the case but hard ciders gained a lot of, of popularity over the years and so you see I've seen a lot more just links on their websites say here cider go here do this so I think they've alleviated the problems a little bit Yep, same exact thing. Yep. Oh yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's it's pretty much the same process. Uh, this was made by uh, the majority of pears in this are Lincoln pears, which are a little bit more starchy and a little bit more tart than a lot of pears. They're not not really dense like some uh, pears you'd buy at the supermarket. But uh, yeah, we've got about five Lincoln pear trees, and then a, I think a Douglas maybe and a kefir. No. Chris is shaking. No idea. Okay. <laughs> Thought you were telling me I was wrong. I probably am. All right. I will let Paul come up. Paul knows a lot more. So like I said, if he says something that goes against what I said, probably listen to him. We took over from uh, Chug and Joyce Wilson's, hence the name. 
Uh, it's got about 45 acres of apples on it. Uh, you can see there, most of it's on M7, semi-dwarf stuff. This picture was taken, we've since taken a lot of that stuff off, and we got about 10 acres now on uh, dwarfing rootstock. We're trying to maintain that at a sort of pedestrian level where nobody used ladder, including our own pickers. Um, it's kind of an unusual uh, spot. We got, like I say, about 45 acres of apples, and the rest of it's just holding the world together there. We've got Rapid Creek running through the middle of it, and woods and deer and coons and trouble everywhere. Uh, so, but yeah, people come out and, and uh, enjoy the orchard. Um, we have overall over the two farms, got about 160 acres of land. Um, one orchard, the one you just saw, is open to the public. Uh, we have a bakery there. You know, it's the whole thing, the bakery and the cider. Uh, recently, we opened a, uh, a pretty big uh, 10,000 square foot event center and uh, restaurant. Um, and that's actually gone pretty good. We, we had a lot of people interested in events and we were kind of, it's one of those slippery slope things. Uh, you know, we, we kind of got a daughter, she went to art school, right? And then uh, public relations. And I thought, well, she's gonna be sleeping in the basement the rest of our lives. Uh, <laughs> but turns out she was pretty good at, at uh, marketing. And so she started, uh, doing some weddings at the orchard but we didn't have an indoor space so then she talked us into building this event center and we thought well then we're going to get in the hard cider business we ought to have hard cider there too and then we're well if we're going to have cider we're going to have to have some food so one thing leads to another and next thing you know your banker's best friend right so anyway so we got this uh event center and restaurant it's kind of a we call it the cidery uh looks over the creek that you just saw and uh, we use that as a bit of a testing ground for our new cider stuff. Uh, we come out with uh, a different cider pretty much every month. Um, and we use that as a way to sort of gauge public opinion. Most of the time people spitting it on the floor, you probably don't wanna take that to market. Um, but we've done some, some weird crap too that works out pretty good. We made a coffee cider one time that I thought was just the worst idea in the world. It went over pretty good. Um, so there's different stuff that works, different stuff that doesn't. The other farm uh, is really not open to the public. It's where we make all the cider, but we do some sweet cider as well. Um, and we do the hard cider there. We do pack some apples out. We also raise sheep because we've got too much time on our hands. Um, so of the, between the two farms, we've got 65 acres of apples. We grow for some reason that still befuddles me. We grow over 130 varieties of apples. Um, a lot of that is stuff that we inherited. Some of it's just two or three trees of this. Um, and we're sort of whittling that down a little bit, but it seems like every time, you know, the, the thing about you get these catalogs in the winter and you're just like, guy, that, that variety sounds really good. So then you want 10 of those trees. So <clears throat> we, we had it down to about 100 varieties. Now it's back up. Um, of the, yeah, so we have about 40 acres of U-Pick. We've been planting for the last three years uh, cider-specific varieties at the orchard that's not open to the public. Um, one thing you do learn at a U-Pick orchard is people will drive from South Carolina to pick, you know, Arkansas black, or, I mean, they will, it, it, there's unbelievable interest in some of these old varieties, but they want like three apples, or they want a half a bushel, and they're there talking your ear off for, half a day during your busiest season uh, trying to do that. So uh, why we got into the sheep business, we grow Katahdin sheep, which are hair sheep. Um, does a couple things for us. Mostly they mow up the pumice. So as you're, as you're pressing apples, you end up with a lot of pumice. You know, you're only getting about 75% of the weight of that apple out in any, e even a really good pressing system, we only get about that. So 25% of that stuff is just there. It doesn't compost real well. Um, you can compost it, but uh, the best thing to do is run it through a ruminant animal. So sheep seem to eat. Uh, we tried pigs. Jim Cohen got me going on pigs, right? He said, oh, yeah, you just give it to the pigs. They just take it. Pigs love to play in it, okay? And then they love to break your fences down. And then they love right during the middle of apple season to go into your neighbor's yards where all these new yards are just planted and rip them up. So sheep are pretty easy, actually. 
So we make a variety of, of products. Uh, like I say, we've got quite a few seasonals that we're doing uh, anymore. Um, we try to, we're, so Benji talked about an interesting dilemma that I think every single Iowa producer faces, which is you call up this Iowa ABD, right? And you talk to one of these people there after about three calls you get through, and then they say, well, what do you want to do? Well, we want to make hard cider. Well, what's going to be the alcohol level? Well, I don't know what the alcohol level is because I don't know what the fruit's going to come in. Well, if it's 6.2% or less, you're going to be a beer. If it's 6.2% or above, you're going to be a wine. I said, well, some years it's going to be above, some years it's going to be below. Well, you got to decide. So we chose winery just like you guys. So then we're, we're going along and, and making this stuff and selling it. We got a winery license and we're paying the big tax. And I get the form to fill out the first month and I say, uh, well, what do we do with the stuff that wasn't 6.2% or above? Where do I, I don't see any place on your form to put that. She says, well, you can't make it. I said, well, we are making it. We've been selling it. So then the next thing I know, I'm sitting at a table in Des Moines surrounded by 20 suits, you know, all glaring at you saying, you know, this is not, this will not work. We're shutting you down, you know. Well, and then they get your heart racing, and then they come up with a solution, which is pretty simple. You pay them a lot more money, and you get a, a beer license. I mean, the, the tax is, is more expensive on the winery, but it's only 25 bucks a year. The beer license is way more expensive, like, I want to say it's 375 a year or something like that. But the tax is quite a bit cheaper. So anyway, so they were happy, I was happy. We go cruising through. So we started off with bottles. We're kind of tending more towards cans because these young hipsters we got working with us are all saying, you know, cans are the way to go. So that's kind of what we're doing. You can see there my uh, daughter, she does the artwork, so she's kind of proved her worth and she's not living in the basement anymore so we're kind of happy about that so just a little bit i mean our process to be honest i didn't know you know benji being the school professor he's kind of laid it all out so this is kind of just a renewal course here but we do it pretty much exactly the same way benji's doing it you know you you squeeze this cider you pitch some uh, SO2 in it to kill off the wild yeast. You put your commercial yeast in, you ferment it. We ferment a little bit on the cold, so I will talk about that. Um, and then we, we settle it out, we rack it, we settle it, we filter it, we carbonate it, we package it, and hopefully you guys buy it. Um, so that's the basic process right there. Pressing apples, fermenting, we rack it, that gets the, the the cider off the lees, all the dead yeast could give off flavors, um, and it can contribute to, to a secondary fermentation if you're not careful. Um, we age it. We found aging works really good for us. Uh, then we filter it. We blend it. Oh, there, my daughter wouldn't like that at all, but we bottle or, or kegging it. That's what we're doing. Um, we have a different kind of press, so that ours is a belt press. Um, we're lazy, so this works really good for us. So one guy can produce about 200 gallons an hour with this press, and, and he's got plenty of time to listen to his iPhone or whatever the heck else he's doing. Not working usually. Um, but anyway, so basically the apple goes up there, and you can see that uh, thing there. These pictures aren't very good, but uh, that's, that's one of the belts there. It just basically sandwiches that chopped up pumice, uh, gets sandwiched between two belts and it gets squeezed kind of like through a ringer washing machine, really. Um, and then juice comes down, you pump it out, and you go to fermenting it. That right there is a picture of our beautiful dump truck that we use to transport that pumice. So that's the product, and you know we're always trying to get that pumice, of course, as dry as you can to get as much juice as you can. Uh, but the sheep seem to love that stuff. I mean, sheep and cattle will, I mean, cattle have, we, we give it to our neighbor, we don't have cattle, but neighbor has cattle, they'll break a fence down to get to this stuff. It has roughly the value of corn, uh, a little bit lower on protein, a little bit higher on, on, um, on soluble solids, but it, it's good feed for ruminant animals. Uh, cattle in particular, dairy farms, can make good use of this stuff. Uh, it, 
it works best though when they have you know kind of a steady supply to give it to them hot and heavy for two months and then give them something else I guess that's not the best idea uh, I put this in there we do do some some uh, sweet cider and we use this pasteurizer cobbled up thing and an old uh, filler and stuff but I put it in there because we're getting a lot of rumors around the edges about pasteurization being required for hard cider. You know, the FDA right now, if you make sweet cider, they're going to be all over you, especially if you either sell outside the state or, in our case, if you ever bring apples in from outside. My, I grew up in Michigan in the apple business. My family's still there, so if we're not long on apples, if we need apples, we'll pull apples in from Michigan. Well. That's all the FDA needed to hear to decide that they needed to come in and inspect us every year. So, but they've never inspected the hard cider side of our business, which is just the other side of a wall. And, but now there's a lot of talk about, there's some new studies. The reason they don't worry about it is that E. coli have been proven not to survive in alcohol. But there are other nasty bacteria that at levels less than 6%, they're now saying you can't conclusively prove that they all die. So there's some idea that hard cider will have to be uh, pasteurized either pre-fermentation or in the bottle or you know, at, at some time or another. So just as you guys gear up, and, and we should make a plug for CiderCon, uh, the national uh, uh, Cider Makers Association puts on an annual event called CiderCon. That's in Chicago here coming up early February. It is by far the best show for anybody interested in there. But the most interesting thing about CiderCon is always the opening bell where they get everybody in a big room. Last year, I think it was like 1,200 people in Baltimore. And they give you little, little uh, dinger things that you, everybody gets to say what, what answer these questions and then it puts the results up there. The most interesting one is always how many of you are, haven't produced any cider but are getting ready, are planning a cidery right now and it's almost always at about 50%. So there's still a lot of interest in cider. There's a lot of, of cideries in planning out there right now. So if you're one of those, um, you might want to just think a little bit about whether pasteurization is going to be required or not. Fermentation, uh, yep, like Benji and those guys, we use commercial yeast. We like a slower ferment. We, we like to ferment down around 60, 65. We think it gives a little better flavor. Um, I will mention that, uh, I should have mentioned before about our apples that we use. Benji did a really nice job talking about his. Our blend tends to be very similar to what theirs is. We, we mix a, uh, a, a sweet and tart. Uh, we probably go a little bit sweeter maybe um, but we go uh, sweet and tart, and uh, we don't have a lot of apples in our repertoire that have tannins, so we can't make a really nice English cider like Deidre um, can yet. Um, we're getting there, but it's slower. We, so we try and extract every bit of flavor we can out of what we have to work with. Uh, our ferments are taking 10 to 15 days. We do reuse yeast a few generations. We find that speeds up fermentation a little bit. Like those, like the deals, we ferment to dry and then we back sweeten, uh, and we use SO2, of course, to prevent. I mean, that's just standard. So the the scoop on hard cider is that it's made like a wine, sold like a cider, or sold like a beer. I think that describes our operation pretty pretty nicely. There are a lot of higher end ciders now that are made like wines and sold like wines, and uh, and that's a good program. Um, it's just not our program. Like the deals, we're sort of always stumbling. Okay, we use these uh, plate and frame filters. So again, we, fil we ferment and then we rack and then we, we uh, hold stuff in these 330 gallon totes for about a month and then the stuff settles out more and we run it through these filters. And this gets rid of the, of any, uh, it, it clarifies the stuff really nicely, makes it real sparkly. Um, and then we go from here right into bright tanks. 
We do use some pectinase enzymes. We don't use a lot of finding agents. We haven't had to, but we do use uh, some pectinase enzymes to clarify the back sweetened uh, product. So if we want to, we always back sweeten with cider, or if it's like a cherry product, we back sweeten with cherry juice. Um, but that stuff, we use pectinase to clarify it ahead of adding it back, because otherwise um, it's just a real problem to get it through these filters. Uh, then we have a series of bright tanks, uh, same thing, you know, you use a carbonation stone in them and get them cold, this is inside a cooler, and, um, and yep, that's how we do it. We, we've never tried bottle conditioning, it's worked. I mean, this is a pretty easy program. Um, anything more difficult than that would be way beyond us. So, uh, in terms of packaging, so we've kind of do it slightly different. We use mobile bottling units. So um, we had one come in from Michigan to do our glass bottles. We have another one come in from Twin Cities to do uh, cans. Um, it's just, you know, saves you 100 grand or something like that. To, it, it, you know, it, if you do it by hand, it's a lot of work. If you do it automatic, it's a lot of money. So this kind of is a sort of easy way out of that program, but it's expensive. It's, it's way more expensive than doing it on your own. Um, you do have to use, you know, counter pressure filling. It's not like you can use that sweet cider filler to fill this carbonated product. Um, so uh, you gotta use counter pressure filler. It makes the equipment a lot more expensive. Um, and you can provide stability through sterile filtration. We use sterile filtration. In bottle pasteurization, which is just a lot of room or it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, potassium sorbate's another way. We like kegs just, just like you guys do. I mean, they're just, it's so easy to make. Uh, people seem to like it. The profit margins are a lot better. Um, if we could sell everything in kegs, we'd be the happiest people in the world, but we're not that smart. Um, I think that's all I had, so I'll, I don't know where we're at on time. What? Yeah, we got time for questions. All right. Questions? Come on, you lot. What flavor are we taking? Oh, okay. Well, uh, so this is our latest thing. This is a uh, rosé, but it's really made with uh, hibiscus, so it's a little bit drier um, than some of our stuff. Uh, we were looking for something that. Yeah. So you get in the alcohol business, kind of like selling tennis shoes and that kind of crap. You know, you, you got to kind of keep up with all the trends and stuff. And rosé is really hot because Angry Orchard came out with a rosé and, you know, set the world on fire again. So that's all of our people were asking us, when are we going to make a rosé? When we So we screwed around with different things. But we ended up using hibiscus. We do have some fruit that actually makes a nice tinge, but it's hard to deliver uh, a nice tinge. All the fruit that we had that gave it that nice tinge didn't necessarily, we never came up with a nice flavor profile. So... We ended up using, this one is a combination of, uh, we use quite a bit of Jonathan in this, in this particular one. So Jonathan gives you some tartness on the back. Um, hibiscus gives you that kind of sharp flavor and a little hint maybe of, of it, it's like a tannin replica. Um, and then just, you know, we use a lot of, uh, we, when I planted our orchard um, in, uh, 07, I planted way more galas than a person should have ever the right to grow in our operation. So we ended up with a lot of galas. So we use a lot of galas as an apple. We like to press them. They store well for us and uh, they make a decent juice. So this basically is probably mostly gala, some Macintosh, a lot of Jonathan and hibiscus um, and then carbonation. And back sweetening, we back sweeten with Jonathan juice actually on this one. So that's what you got there. Is your, is your filter then a diatomaceous bird filter? No. These are, um, these are just sheet filters. Um, I don't know how to describe them. It's, uh, it's like sheets of paper, but thicker, maybe like a piece of cardboard almost. And you can buy them in different, um, different poracities. So you can go from like 1,000 grade on down. This is a PAL. That different, Manufacturers have different systems for grading them, but they're all the same. You can get them coarser filters or finer filters, 
right down to EK, which is supposed to be, it's not pure sterile, but it's fairly close to sterility. Okay, so you have to run it through the coarse filters first, why we got two filters. We'll run it through the coarse filter and then out of there right into a finer filter and, and out you go. And then, it, so it goes from our racking um, uh, totes, we go into the coarse filter, out of the coarse filter into a fine filter, out of the fine filter, we go into the bright tanks and then we carbonate. You just replace them. You can back flush them about once, maybe twice, but it's an expensive way to do it. I mean, as soon as we make our first gazillions, we're going to invest in a in a nice cross flow filter where you don't have to do any of that. But that's, you know, it's uh, sixty five to eighty thousand dollars, something like that, for a small. Is that your sterilization More or less, yeah, oh. yep. You can, like I say, you can use potassium sorbate. You can use. Um, in bottle pasteurization as well. Yeah. Do you know if the flavored beer industry, like the apple flavored beer, is that something you'd ever get into, or is that not even real apples? Is that artificial? That has nothing to do with apples. Yeah. So it's not a flavor. It's not. They don't. It's flavored. It's just apple flavoring on top. Yeah. I don't think there's any. I mean, you know. So you have in in the states, uh, Angry Orchard is like seventy percent of all the hard cider sold, and they, they make theirs with concentrate, which is the easy way to do it. I mean, it, it's, it's still, it's, you know, so concentrate is apple juice with the water taken out of it. Mostly it's from China. Then you bring it over here, you can add the water back, and then you can ferment that just fine, yep. But the apple beer, like the red ale and all that stuff, as, as I understand it, that's just beer with apple flavoring on top of it. It's not cider, yeah, yep. There are now some new government regulations that are kind of helping to define cider because cider was always this uh, ugly child between wine and beer. The TTB didn't really know what to do with it. The state's alcohol divisions didn't know what to do with it. That's getting clarified some now. So, I, I mean, even the carbonation thing is, is starting to get easier now. I'm curious about that, um, the mobile bottling that you mentioned. Yeah. So Yep. Um, so, and then, is there any concerns about you know having your product ready to bottle but not having a bottler available, or can that can that sit? Yeah. It's a, it's a you know outside of the cost, that's the biggest problem with mobile bottling is especially like right now you could call this guy Nate up there at Lager Smith and he'd be he'd have somebody down there tomorrow because right now nobody bottling beer. But during the season when everybody's bottling beer, that's the season you want to be bottling your cider, and they, you're talking, you know, six weeks out. It, it depends. We do it regular with them, so we have a kind of inside track. But uh, a lot of times it's six to eight weeks out. And then the other problem is, is you got to have enough capacity, you know. So you saw our bright tanks. We got. We got a whole nother bank of them as well. And that's all because sometimes we got to bottle, you know, every bit of fermented product that, that we have at once because we won't get them back for three weeks or something, so. And will that sit in the bright tanks fine without any, you know? Yeah, it, it, yeah it's got carbon, it's, it, you know, it's carbonated. Um, it, it doesn't bother, but I mean, we never do it. We're always playing catch up. We're never that organized, so it's, it's like, um, we get about a week ahead, we can start filling all those tanks and then get it ready for them. So the couple that you, you just want it stable. Getting the carbonation stable is really critical to, to making bottling work. And, it, and it's a struggle. <coughs> Deidre. How many size bottles will we do? Is it, is it uh, uh, like one or two different types of bottles or sizes? Yeah, so numbers? bottles are really tricky because the, the standard of the bottling industry is, is a Mahine, and Mahine, for some reason, I still don't understand. Like, you can get a rotary filler, and you just raise it up to, to bottle bombers, or raise it up a little more to bottle 750s, or take it down to bottle 12 ounce. But a Mahine is very, very specific to a bottle. In fact, even different 12 ounce bottles will not work on this machine. So you have to find a bottle. That's why we get one from Michigan, because that's the one that we found that had a Mahine that would work for our size bottle. 
Okay, so you got to match, especially glass bottles, with the um, machine that the that the mobile bottling unit has. With cans, it's a lot easier because cans are more standardized. Um, but if you wanted like a 16 ounce can, you'd have to find somebody that could handle that. And there are machines that'll do both. But um, yeah. A couple questions, I guess. Yeah. One that comes to the mobile bottling. Does he do both the cans and the bottles? There are some that do. Ours, we use two different people. Um, the guy that we had to, to do bombers, 22 ounce glass, was a guy. And then when we wanted to go into 12 ounce, he didn't have that machine, so we went to Michigan. Then we wanted to do cans, he didn't have that, so we went back to the guy that did the 22 ounce that now had a canning machine. By and large, the people with mobile bottling units are going by the wayside. They're, everybody's rushing into cans right now. So if you want to get into your own bottling unit, Right now, after, I mean, we looked hard for about two years at buying a glass bottling unit, and you couldn't find them. Now, cripes, they give them away when you buy a pack of Cheetos or something. I mean, they're everywhere on these. Now you're talking about buying a new set. Yeah, right. So what's your mix right now from glass to cans? Well, we're pretty much moving. Right now, I mean, we're going to do one big bottling push coming up, and then we're going to go completely into cans. Uh, start by this summer, hopefully, yeah. I mean, there'll be remnants, you know, it'll drag out for a while, but yeah. So eventually we'll have our own canning line. It'll just be a lot easier to be able to do everything ourselves. But, you know, to, to Steve's point, that's really a big advantage of canning or of having your own machine is that then you can do small batches and you can do, you know, both small batches of stuff you're doing on a regular basis, but you can also do uh, small batch trials of stuff and things like that and stability tests and, and you know it's, it's just a lot easier program so one more question. okay one more there was somebody in the back there yeah what, what cider apple varieties are you most interested in okay um, well you're going to get the maestro up here next so uh, I, I won't go into too much but I can tell you from my experience uh, English cider apples are a huge pain in the wazooties um, I mean, they're just, they bloom at exactly the wrong time for us. They, they bloom starting when everything else is shutting down. So they start to bloom in about mid-May, most of these varieties that we plant. We have probably 25 varieties planted. And um, they tend to want to start blooming just when conditions start to get perfect. You know, they, the temperatures come up well above the 60 degree threshold, the humidities come up, you start to get these nice light rains. So, you know, it, it's been a real struggle for us. And then they don't, they don't bloom and quit. They want to bloom and bloom and bloom a lot of these. So um, this is the first year we actually harvested much. We've had a, three years and, and I bought some really god awful looking trees the first year. Um, and so it took three years before we could get a crop off that. I just didn't want to crop them. Um, but this year we did crop them and I would, I would say that, um, that I mean, we really like Dabonet as a tree. A lot of people say if you're going to plant one, one cider apple, Dabonet is a really good one. It's a more annual cropper. That's the other thing about English and the French cider apples. A lot of them are biannual. They'll bear a lot one year and off the next. Uh, Dabonet, um, Yarlington Mill, we like. Um, we, I will say the early cider we've had from Yarlington Mill is seems like the tannins are pretty sharp on that. I, I'm not very impressed with that just yet, but we haven't really worked with them a lot yet to know. So about two years, maybe you can come back to me on that question, or you can just ask Deidre here and she'll have all the answers for you anyways. So. All right, thanks, you guys. I'm 100 miles away from home, but I'm certainly no maestro or, or expert. And I'm, a, I guess, a zero generation grower because I found myself uh, born in Chicago and raised in the suburbs. But since I got involved with horses pretty deeply at a young age, I went off to college and thought I would be an equine vet. And then that's where I met agriculture and ag classes. And so I went into agriculture more for developing countries and spent about 20 years uh, working in and out of, of Africa. And when I was back in school working on another degree in agriculture, I met my husband, or who would become my husband, and he asked me, you have all this stuff in agriculture, but have you ever thought about having a farm? And I was like, 
me have a farm? <laughs> How would I have a farm? So anyway, um, I accuse him now of just um, not wife shopping, but farmer shopping. So uh, I'm the I'm the farmer in the couple, and um, we, uh, after about uh, seven years, we did finally uh, find some farmland, and we just bought some land in southwest Wisconsin in the beautiful Driftless area because it just had a pretty landscape. We just fell in love with it. We didn't know what our business would be, but uh, when we got it at the end of 2002, we thought, all right, now, what is that business going to be? We always knew we would do it organically and that we wanted to do some sort of high-quality finished product. So, um, and there were certainly a lot of wild apple trees around on the farm, so apples was an obvious thing. Uh, but we were considering other things, and, um, but I found myself as a grant proposal reviewer for the USDA reading on um, hard cider. And so I shared that with him, and I did notice that in his file of farm ideas, there were some pages ripped out of American Airline magazines of being the vineyard grower in Napa Valley. So I think he thought he could kind of, you know, see himself doing this. But um, again, it turned out uh, that, I, that I'm the farmer and he's the one who held the job down to, uh, uh, to have the money to pay for the farm, which we're still paying on. Um, so uh, we decided that we would pursue cider. Although in 2003, it was a relatively unknown beverage in the US. It's America's oldest beverage, or original beverage, since a lot of Brits came over uh, to colonize, or we were the new colonies. Um, but um, uh, it would take a lot of work to, uh, to bring cider into the marketplace. Um, we also learned about English and French cider varieties, and we thought, if we wanted to make the best product we could, what are the apple varieties you use? Just like if you're, since cider is made like a wine, if you, I mean, what are the best grapes to use for the kind of wine you want to make? So we, we, we took it from the approach of what are the apples uh, we need to produce the kind of ciders we had in mind. And, but we quickly found out that those apple varieties weren't even available in the US. These are tannic varieties of apples. Um, actually, they're not all tannic, but at least in the English and French um, grouping of cider apples, they include some that uh, contain tannins. And tannins, like in a wine grape, uh, are, can give mouthfeel or complexity to your, to your finished beverage. So that's what we are after, because we, we, we envision doing a very wine-like product, since as you've heard from, from Benji and, and Paul, it's a very wine-like process that you're making them through. So none were commercially available uh, in the US back in 2003. So not to be deterred, we took a grafting class um, from Dan Bussey, uh, who had his own orchard in Wisconsin. And uh, he also um, later on went on to run the Seed Savers Exchange Orchard. Some of you may know, may know that. So Dan taught us to graft, and then um, slowly but surely I started grafting trees, two or 300 at a time, sometimes alongside Dan. He had a lot of the cyan wood in his um, own collection of trees. Then I also contacted the uh, US Germplasm Repository in Geneva, New York, and got some cyan wood. They just send you like maybe two or three little sticks. Um, so it was, it was a slow start. Now I can graft off of my own trees and I've also got other sources just as the cider industry, I mean it's become an industry again in the US now. So um, I've found sources in New York and in, in Michigan. Um, so I was doing my own grafting for about 10 years, and then as I needed to start hiring people to help me in the orchard, I was able to teach them to graft, and so able to provide employment earlier in the season. And then in this particular year, challenged my, my crew to, this is 2016, to graft uh, 3,000. So we were starting, it enabled us to, to ramp up production. And also I borrowed from uh, Jim Cohn, in Michigan, he's the largest certified organic grower in the Midwest, um, a, a, a way of getting trees out into the field after a year. So we would graft them in the winter, get the roots going while the, while the union's calloused, really at least a, a month or two with the roots just growing in cold conditions, and then plant them out into a hoop house. We uh, started using raised beds and of just compost and uh, overhead irrigation. 
and uh, putting the sides down in early April and really trying to spur the top to, uh, to, grow, to grow quickly. So that enabled us to, uh, to increase production. Also, um, then a couple nurseries started coming online that you could contract with to produce trees. So similar to what Steve was saying, uh, just because like I'm on dwarfing rootstocks, I would need to contract two, three years in advance. But I took my first, um, the first order of trees I did was in 2012, and I took those, uh, they came to the farm in 2014, and those were Dabinet, which uh, Paul was just talking about. So this, so we, we got around the, the tree thing, but then the next thing was cider production. How are we actually going to, to make the, the, uh, the product? Uh, we considered building a winery on the farm uh, and hired an architect and an engineer and worked with our township. We have very challenging topography and we learned very early on too that your bottles, for example, will probably come in a semi-truck. If we wanted to buy in any uh, tart apples for blending, those might come in on a semi-truck. So we were just trying to figure out how could you ever get a semi in and out of our very rolling uh, land. We also would not be able to do retail there because like Steve's mentioning, we don't have much, much for parking. I'd literally have to pave over the prairie we established to put in a parking lot. Um, so I started looking uh, in 2011 for a winery in the area to contract with to make our ciders. So 2011 was, was the first year we're going to get any sort of crop over 100 bushels. So I was looking for a place that made high quality wines that they had the capacity to contract with to do ciders and an interest to make ciders. And I really wasn't finding that in, in our region. So I just said, all right, A to Z. What, you know, we could sell the apples, we could, I'd read about uh, the second distillery opening in Wisconsin, and it happened to be near Madison. So called him up, he made apple brandy, he contracted for another grower I knew, and he was very intrigued by our apple varieties. So we went with, we went with Yahara Bay Distillers, a distillery just outside of Madison, um, to make our apple brandy. And so we've come out with, uh, in 2013, after a couple years of aging, we came out with um, a two-year aged apple brandy. And then we've continued to produce apple brandy or do a release of apple brandy every year and also came out with a three-year and then just this fall came out with our first uh, five-year aged apple brandy. So we felt like also with um, some of the packaging and branding that uh, we were able to get that we got kind of a, at least a, a toehold into the marketplace with a, with a fine, reputable product that would help our brand. But it still didn't solve the cider production. So uh, some people moved in on a neighboring farm uh, that had been on the market for a long time who were from the Chicago area, so they're just up on weekends. And, uh, but the husband happens to uh, do farm-to-table restaurants in Chicago area. And they buy product from the four states around Chicago, and that includes all their, their beverages. So they're very much into uh, craft spirits, craft beer, craft wines, and cider. And they really wanted to have their own house cider. So he said, well, I see you exploring around for how you might um, get your cider made. How about I buy the juice? I know a winery in Illinois, and we sell it at the restaurant. So we went with that, gave it, and we ter termed it our beta test. Let's see how well that winery does, if it's worth having it made uh, in Illinois. Chicago was certainly a market we wanted to get into, so there's an advantage there. And so everything went great. It sold well, they did a great job, and so um, we've been working with that winery in the Chicago area um, ever since. So now we have two products in the marketplace, ciders um, that uh, are focusing on or featuring our English and French um, bitter cider apples, some that we ferment to cider, and some that we ferment to our Wisconsin apple brandy. Um, and now we also have been able to uh, put on the back label that these are all made with our organic apples. 
Um, we've since gotten the distillery to go organic for fruit brandies. So we'll be able to start putting organic on the front label of our products, um, starting with our probably next year when our next two year release comes out. Um, so with the um, restaurant partners, they did kegs and bottles. And they found that in their restaurants, the keg product was moving, but bottles were not. And they had packaged in all 750 cork and cage wine bottles. So it's about a $3.50 investment just in your bottle, your packaging alone. So um, we decided we would just go into, start with, start with kegs, and we, start, we found a distributor in Wisconsin and one in Illinois, and so we started working with them to move our, our kegs into restaurants, and it was very slow. You just do not build a brand with a keg product, and especially when you don't have, you know, a farm retail center like, like the other, like Benji and Paul have described. So in 2017, we added a bottling line just to get us further into debt. <laughs> so, um, but you know, I said, I said to my husband, if we don't do bottles, we will die. But at least, it, let's try the bottling line, at least we'll have died trying, so. <laughs> but we haven't died yet. So um, we also came up with a, with a new logo and started packaging in 500 ML bottles. Um, I did, uh, as I was going around trying to sell our keg ciders, I would ask restaurants, what packaging would you want the what our ciders to be in? And I got pushback on larger formats, and so we went with a smaller one of a 500 milliliter bottle. And so um, there, and then we've um, actually come out with um, five different styles of cider, or actually I should say four ciders and a sizer. And how many of you know what sizer is? So sizer happens when you ferment honey with your apple juice, it becomes sizer. So it has a higher alcohol content since your wine yeast are fermenting two sugars. So ours is a 9.2, uh, at least that vintage is. And then, um, it, it, and then we uh, also back sweetened that one with, with some of the honey. We have beehives on our farm that we have another beekeeper manage. So um, it's great to have honey sourced from our farm. And we'll source another local honey keeper, uh, beekeeper if, if, uh, if the hives didn't produce enough. That one though, we get to pay, um, we charge more for, because we have to pay a wine tax on it and of course uh, the cost of the honey. So right now they're passing around samples of our classic dry. And that's the cider I like everyone to try. Um, that one is the best representation of our apples. We have five of our tannic English cider apples blended into a tart apple base. It's about 6.3% alcohol. And we, um, are, what's, what's uh, underneath every cider label or uh, title, like under the oak age there, it says cider refreshment with wine complexity. So that's what we're trying to communicate um, our brand as, is one that's going to give you a wine-like experience. So um, we keep our labeling pretty simple. We're trying to feature uh, the apple. Um, the second one you're going to get to try is the one in the purple uh, called Tremlets, and that's named after an apple I grow called Tremlets Bitter. So I blended that with another variety called Priscilla, and it wound up being a, a home run. That one will be, you'll taste secondly, because it just has a touch of sweetness to it. Um, with that vintage, we had a very cool fall uh, as we got towards harvest in 2016, and that actually increased the acidity levels in our apples. And uh, as I know it did in some other um, orchards. And so we had to back sweeten with just a little bit more sugar than we did with our, with our first vintage. So now just a little bit about uh, the cider farm in terms of the horticulture. Uh, it's an evolutionary process. I'm still learning a lot. Um, so we're on stony silt loam soils. Thank you. Um, and I first started planting into a, a fallow ground. Uh, it was three and a half acres. I did cover crop it for um, three years while I was waiting for my trees in the tree nursery. Uh, it was totally fallow, so we got our neighbor to come in with his chisel plow, um, and then I just kept disking it up and uh, turning uh, crops of buckwheat and other things in. 
Um, then as, we've, as we uh, have been kind of filling that out, it kind of ebbs and flows because we keep getting fire blight. It's our worst place for fire blight. Um, but then we uh, started moving into uh, some other row crop ground on the farm that was uh, about a 14 acre piece. And I hope to fill that out um, with trees this spring and uh, then after, I'm gonna hit the pause button, and then after a couple year, years we'll, turn, we'll go into the, uh, another nine acre field. Uh, I started out grafting on M7s just because that's what Dan Bussey was using, and then I, but I uh, was interested in the in the semi dwarfs, and then early on switch, or excuse me, the dwarfs, and then early on switch to uh, switch to bud nines. So, the um, the three and a half acre piece is uh, where we started is all a vertical axe kind of system. Uh, the rows are 15 to 20 feet apart. Uh, we. I mean, back when I was first started planting these trees out in 2006, I had nobody to tell me what my planting distances should be, you know, what I, I mean, especially if I was doing them on, on dwarf rootstock. So it's, it's been just kind of a, a, a total learning experience. Um, now I'm doing more of a tall spindle. Uh, as I went into the, the crop ground field, um, I started out with 15 foot rows, and the next year I planted at 14 feet, then the next year I planted at 13 feet, and then the next year 12 feet, and now I'm just staying at 12. So we do 12 foot and then three feet to four feet between the, the trees. Now that there's a little more information coming, um, I'm able to get uh, do the ones that I know are gonna be more vigorous at a four foot spacing, whereas the others are all at three. I do have two uh, disease-resistant cultivars of Liberty and Priscilla. And I tell you, when we got our first blossom on those English cider apples, and, um, and we also got our first fire blight infection, and it was not insignificant. It wailed on us. I could have hugged those Liberty trees because they just, they just jumped up, and, and, and the Priscilla, they just, just jumped up and gave me apples. Um, so, and then we also, um, while I focus on growing tannic fruit, my husband likes to say I, I grow horrible tasting apples and they're sometimes ugly, because um, <laughs> tannins don't really taste good to eat. So I'm not, I'm not trying to grow apples that taste good, I'm trying to grow apples that drink well. Um, so, and then we will buy um, organic apple juice from uh, Harry Hoke at Hoke Orchards in La Crescent, Minnesota. And he has his own press. So, and he'll work with us on, on whatever blend we want. He'll tell us what's available so we can try to make it more tart or higher sugar or whatever. Um, but, that's, but that's worked very well if we, if we want to get more supplemental juice to the uh, Liberties and Priscilla's coming off of mine for the blends we're trying to do for the five different styles of cider we have currently. We, do, we did do two other experimental ones this year. Uh, working with another local winemaker where um, we did a Belgian cider saison that we're going to continue and bottle this next year. And then also I'm growing some red fleshed apples. So I'll show you my, my list of um, varieties that I started with. Uh, and I'm going to uh, hope to be having enough to do a rosé. But what I first started with, well, actually, when I first grafted with Dan, uh, he had about 30-some varieties in his, in his orchard that I was doing in my nursery. And then as I met, uh, I took a trip out east uh, to meet with some orchardists and cider makers, and they said, narrow that down, do 10 or 12, otherwise you're going to have too many varieties to manage. So I did Ellis Bitter, which, despite the reputable source I got it from, turned out to not be the real Ellis Bitter, but we like it anyway. So we just call it the Cider Farm Ellis Bitter. Uh, Chisel Jersey, Kingston Black, Bramley Seedling. This uh, Madai Door is a French one, standing for gold medal. It is not. <laughs> uh, uh, Major Dabinet, uh, Somerset Red Streak, Tremlets, and Brown's Apple. And now I've taken some of those out, or they've taken themselves out. Uh, now I do the real Ellis Bitter. Uh, and thanks to going to CiderCon, another plug for CiderCon, because I saw Nikki Rothwell of Michigan State University and Tandem Ciders, she had pictures of Ellis Bitter. And at first I thought, that's not Ellis Bitter. <laughs> and then I came to find out, no, what I have is not Ellis Bitter. Uh, Chisel Jersey, Kingston Black, I really don't care for, for growing Kingston Black. And uh, so I would never recommend it to anybody. And in fact, when we took a trip to the UK, 
we were uh, in the in an orchard or in a in a cider mill, and the manager and the owner were both uh, excusing themselves while they had a somewhat vigorous discussion about the milling of this certain apple. And it turned out to be Kingston Black. They said, it is tough to mill. So we thought, all right, take note. So then we go out to the orchard, and this is in October, so they're harvesting. Harvesting by machine. They get all the apples on the ground, and I wish I'd written down what this man said he and his, and his colleague could harvest in a season, but it was hundreds of hectares, just two guys and two machines. Because um, they get them all on the ground, shake have tree shakers if they need them, and just uh, like giant Zamboni machines, get them off, off, sweep them up off the ground. Then he started, so anyway, we're out there, and he starts complaining about a certain apple variety, and he said, where would you even begin to prune this tree? And it was Kingston Black. And he said, and it gets scab, and he said, but British growers, they have to have their Kingston Black cider, and if it was left up to me, I wouldn't even grow the damn tree. So I thought, Take second note, <laughs> Americans don't know about Kingston Black, so <laughs> let's not go there. So if those trees kind of die, I'm kind of like, good. <laughs> uh, Bramley seedling, eh, and that's just a tart. It's a, more of a culinary apple anyway, so it's not giving me the tannins, and I want tannins. Madai door killed itself. It gets fire blight like the Dickens. If it's in the neighborhood, it, it gets it and it dies. I did two plantings of it and finally learned my lesson. Uh, major, um, major, I only, well, major's okay, um, but it's very late blooming. So um, I like the fact that it helps if we, you know, with this wacko weather we have, it might help me. It, it did help me in 2012. Dabinet, love to grow it. Uh, that be, I saw early on that that was grower friendly. Somerset Red Streak, not. Don't, don't buy, great juice, but it's challenging to grow. Uh, Tremlitz bitter, uh, very biennial, and we don't have the real Tremlitz bitter. The one in the UK is a bitter, what they call bittersweet, meaning it's tannic, but not tart. And the one we have in the US is tannic and tart. So I actually like it better. Um, so it's doing very, it's doing well for us it, when, it, when it has a crop. I mean, it, it's an individual tree. It'll crop really heavy. And then the next year, it'll have zero, usually zero apples or at most maybe one or two. So, and I, I could try to thin it, but um, from what I've heard and read, I'd probably spend more money trying to just, I mean, on average, if I averaged out my year's production, I'd probably come out ahead not trying to thin it out. And then Brown's apple is a is an aromatic tart apple, so uh, we use it in our sizer, um, but you know, again, it's not tannic. So uh, for me, it's not a high priority apple. Um, and then some of the ones that I've added, um, my Liberties, I actually got going on the Liberty and Priscilla because somebody gave me M26 rootstocks. So those are very fire blight um, sensitive. So I thought, no way am I putting these English ones on those. So I, I got some Liberty and Priscilla and started that and then um, also did those on Bud Nine. Uh, Porter's Perfection is both a tannic and tart one um, that's been highly recommended to me. I would have uh, added some Yarlington Mill this last year, but um, the, I was actually contracting with Wafflers in New York and he, was say, he said, mm, not so sure I've got the real Yarlington Mill. So there is some confusion when you're ordering trees as to whether the real, you're getting the real variety or not. And it's, uh, it can happen in a variety of nursery sources. So um, crone bush, this is a wild apple tree that was in Minnesota, it died uh, last year. Uh, it was taken to Dan Bussey when he was at Seed Savers because it's very high in tannins and very sweet. So it's both those things. So great, it could be a great one for uh, fermenting and for distilling. So we're trying it, we'll see. And so far it's turning, it's kind of a weak grower, but we'll see. I'm doing some red flesh varieties because I'd like to do a rosé, a genuine rosé cider. Um, since Madai Dor flunked out, I'm doing, I uh, got hold of some Mate from um, uh, Nikki at, at Michigan State, uh, so that, because that is a French brandy apple, and we do what we consider a French style or Calvados style apple brandy, because in, in the Calvados region of France where they do, where they're known for their apple brandy, they use a lot of tannic apples. 
and they also add some pear. So we, we have um, some pear trees, peri pear trees on the farm, so we throw that in the mix. And then we age. Now we're doing an American twist where we age in charred oak bourbon barrels with some wild applewood from the farm. We did a three-year age where we reused a brandy barrel when, brandy, when barrels were in short supply. And we really liked the result. I mean, we thought the French used barrels for generations. <laughs> so let's just repeat use of that barrel. Turned out great. So now uh, when brewers call me, my barrels are not for sale because <laughs> we reuse all of our apple brandy barrels. And we're looking forward to what a real French brandy apple variety might do. And then I've uh, also started grafting two American brandy, brandy apples. So next, I uh, just want to talk about some of the considerations uh, in terms of apple varieties. Uh, that kind of a framework one might use as, as, as you think through. I'm just sharing kind of a framework I found myself using that uh, you might use also. Um, but in terms of marketing and the kind of product you're trying to make, um, horticultural concerns, we've already mentioned some of those, and then some of the um, risk in growing these. So in terms of uh, marketing a product, um, we, uh, our brand is based on using these rare apples and being organic. So that was, that was one thing um, that works for us or that we're, we're electing to do. Uh, we're uh, working on blends that, that feature our apples. So we're not trying to hide the apple or cover it up. And in fact, when um, we are, I am finding a lot of people who do like dry ciders, our brand is dry. And so it doesn't work for everybody, but we find, especially in urban areas, a lot of people prefer that. And in fact, when I'm in stores or at events doing samplings and somebody might say, um, yeah, I don't, I don't care for ciders. And I'll say, well, have you tried a, a dry cider? Maybe you prefer dry. And, they'll, and they'll, they'll taste it and be like, oh, I didn't know cider could be like this. Because they may have just had some of the national brands that do tend to be um, sweet. And there are some people who prefer dry. Yes? For our brandy, uh, we are using, uh, yes, American oak. So it's, it, they're charred oak bourbon barrels with some uh, wild apple wood from our farm. A lot of American bourbon barrels actually then go over to Scotland to age scotch. So uh, at first it was, it was kind of hard. Now with the, you know, with the uh, growing of craft distillation in the States, a lot of those, there's a lot of competition on those barrels. And then a lot of barrel makers have come online now too in response to that. Um, the other thing, as we've already discussed, is what, what kind of format do you want to be in? Kegs, bottles, uh, I forgot to put cans on here. Of course, cans. Cans, as, as Paul already mentioned, are growing very rapidly. And then what do they communicate? Since our whole tagline is cider refreshment with wine complexity, uh, when, when wine is uh, commonly recognized, good quality wine in cans, you know, then we'll consider cans. But I mean, we even wanted to be in like, uh, have a cork. And, and if you're doing a car, since it's carbonated, it has to be a cork and cage. But you know, it was just the price, price point for that packaging that kept us away from that. And then can you, if you're, if you're in beer packaging, can you sell your product at a beer price and, may, and be profitable? That's one of the things that was said to me back in 2005, because when I went out to, uh, uh, the Northeast to meet orchards and cider makers. They, uh, when, when I went to Bellwether Cider, he was way ahead of the curve, and he said, look, he goes, first thing I want to tell you is don't package in a beer bottle. That was back in 2005. Now, we've seen the explosion in the cider market, and it has been in beer bottles. Um, but he said, I bought a beer bottling line, and, and he says, it's just collecting dust now. So because he found pushback, and he literally had a guy say to him at an at a, uh, event, you know, my wife over there, she would come over here and buy your cider if you were in a wine bottle, but she won't buy it in your beer bottle. So, so anyway, that gave, you know, us something to consider. I think, I mean, you know, fast forward uh, uh, 13, 14 years, there's, you know, so many, so many packaging options. I mean, we actually would prefer a green bottle to that one or a clear bottle, but that 500 ml format of ours 
is there's very it's very narrow in terms of the choices. If we did a 750, lots of choices: clear, green, amber, blue. Um, but in the in the 500 ml, um, it'll it's it's very limited. Yes. Ours are all carbonated, mm -hmm. right? And and though um, I'm really looking forward, I bought from uh, Black Diamond in New York, Ian Merwin, who was um, he's somebody I met in 2005 that has given me a lot of advice over the years. He was the pomologist at at Cornell University, also has his own fruit farm, also makes his own cider, very good cider maker, uh, and he does his still cider. And when you one thing about carbonation and sugar. It, those two things can help you cover up different flaws. When you do a still cider, you're really exposed. You're really naked. I mean, it's really, it's, it's the quality of your fermentation and the quality of your materials. He's knocked it out of the park. We've been making stills, and I think Great. Kind of preserves, preserves that varietal taste of the apples a little more. If you yes. Have uh, carbonic acid from the CO2. Right, right, yeah. So, and it, it it's it's made like a wine, so no, I mean carbonation is not is not necessary at all. So it's it's kind of w more where this market um, has gone. But there are some some uh, still ciders in the marketplace, and and uh, hats off to you if you're able to to do to do a good one because they not they. Very much at the time. <laughs> well, keep it up. Um, so. The next is how are you going to sell that? Uh, like we've seen uh, Benji and Paul have the opportunity to sell it on the farm. We don't. Um, if you want to be off your farm, you have to go through distribution. Um, where and how not everyone wants you. <laughs> I mean, you can really just be locked out of the marketplace because nobody wants to carry you. I mean, distributors look at you for how much money they can make off of selling your, your, your brand, of course, and how much are you going to support it. But it's basically, you know, bottom line, what they feel like they're, gonna, they're going to make off of you. And the cider market has become so crowded in the last few years. Starting in 2011, and for about five years, cider became the fastest growing adult beverage category in the history of the US. So it grew faster than craft beer ever did at its peak. So you've just had, and I mean, that's why we have this session. I mean, what, seven, eight years ago? There really wouldn't have been much interest. People would be like cider and just think of making kind of apple juice. Um, but now we're talking, you know, a fermented beverage that does have a lot of, um, have, have a lot of wide appeal. Yep. You're, you're going yep. distribution. Mm -hmm. You're going between states. What, what does that do for distribution? Are you fermenting it in Illinois? Yeah. Uh, funny you should ask that because um, the other day uh, I had this big white uh, kind of authoritarian looking SUV uh, pull up in my driveway up to my farm building uh, where he found me and he got out with a badge on. Um, and uh, apparently um, we didn't know that our winery um, was supposed to have an out of state shippers permit the one in Illinois for our distributor in Wisconsin to even go there and pick up. So, I mean, we're going to have to pay some, um, like, I don't know if they're taxes or what. I just pleaded innocent and said, hey, I grow the apples and talk to my husband. He's the business guy. <laughs> so, so I entertained him till he got out, till he, he got off the phone. And then, uh, uh, but um, so it, it's something we're going to straighten out. And then also some of what this agent told us wasn't actually correct. Because the next day my husband was on the phone with our attorneys. Um, uh, because what we are doing now is we are going to do um, our own cider production in Madison. So we're going to be opening Madison, Wisconsin's first cidery and tasting room. So we'll be moving our, our equipment, our packaging, our carbonating equipment out of the winery and we're getting our own fermentation tanks and um, putting that into um, a place in, in Madison that we, that, that we found. So we won't, now it'll be, well, now we'll have to figure out the reverse, <laughs> how that's going to happen. So you do, I mean, you don't even know sometimes the laws that are out there. If they feel like you're uh, flag flagrantly violating them, they might then hit you with fines. This guy could say we didn't, I mean, it, it was actually the winery that should have done this or known this. 
And um, so we're, we're going to pay some back taxes because they're basically what I've learned, too, is that it's basically the states and the feds are looking for money. They, 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 they want their tax money. So if you keep them happy with their tax money, then um, you're usually pretty good. Oh, I, I don't know of him getting any summons. Well, you know, the, somebody dropped off at his farm and said, oh, you, your juice went over to the fermented. <laughs> well, that's just juice. He's just moving raw juice, raw apple juice. I mean, yeah, no, no, I, I, I then ship juice. Like, I just had juice delivered to the winery today. We're low on kegs of some things, and our place isn't open yet. In fact, our winery permit is sitting there at the TTB collecting dust. So, um, uh, and I can ship juice there just fine. It's unfermented, but it's when you want to move an alcoholic product. Okay. Yeah. The federal government used to be funded mostly by alcohol until prohibition, so mm -hmm. <laughs> they're still, still after it. Do you plan to do The question is, do we have plans to do social media sales? We have a social media presence, and we... Uh, we do plan to do like a, a wine buying club, a, a cider buying club. Like that's how, how I was able to buy uh, Black Diamond ciders. I just went on the internet and uh, ordered it. And so there's a lot of shipping you can do um, via, uh, you're not directly doing it. People are going through these sort of wine buying, um, their services that you can hire and you can, um, they'll do a lot of the uh, permitting for you. So I don't know the details on that, but once we get our own place going, we will be we will be doing that. And I know that the winery we work with in Illinois does have a wine buying club, and they sell they buy cider from us and sell it through there, which is fine with us. We're just happy to move cider. <laughs> so um, the other thing I was going to ask uh, or mention is uh, trying to do like new but related products. Um, so uh, apples, the cider apples are kind of the hub of our of our farm or in our business. Um, so we've got the brandy coming off, the cider, and now we also do a very small scale. We do some apple fed pork. <laughs> and I've since, after chasing a few pigs uh, and dealing with, I'm not set up to be a hog farmer. So I have, I now contract that out with a local organic grower who comes over and gets the apple pumice and apples and, and takes it um, to his place to feed out the pigs. And then um, my, my husband took to doctoring our maple syrup with our apple brandy. Uh, and uh, so we were enjoying that, and we decided this year to make that a new product. So we got all Wisconsin organic maple syrup and infused it with our apple brandy. And since it's under 1% alcohol, we, don't, we can just sell it directly. So, and then we have another uh, idea of his in the... In, in the pipeline. So we'll, we'll see if we come out with um, something else that uses our, our apple brandy. Um, and then uh, I think I've kind of intimated how I've been kind of a data point of one for many years trying to learn how to grow these very challenging varieties organically in Midwest conditions. Um, there was very little information, very scant on these varieties, and sometimes it was even confusing, if not conflicting. Um, organic uh, was our own personal choice, and it definitely adds cost, but we don't necessarily get a premium for it in the, in the marketplace. Um, I mean, I don't know, because I, ha I don't have a non-organic against which to do a controlled study about that. Um, uh, you've heard about fire blight. Um, that's the biggest, kind of my two major pests with these varieties are fire blight and then uh, round headed apple borer um, because those, those two things are lethal to the trees. Uh, if you're non organic, you won't have to worry about apple borers because other sprays you're doing um, seem to take care of that. But both of those are very uh, labor intensive issues. And then in terms of um, agricultural risk. Um, I'm on dwarfing, so definitely doing irrigation. Um, and then also I'm trying to um, have uh, a wide range of bloom times. So that's like, for example, I, I grow major. Um, I have some other things I don't like about the tree and the apple, um, but it is a bittersweet, so I get, I get some tannins off of it. Uh, for sure, and uh, but it, it blooms really late. And so when we had 2012, where we had summer in March, freezes in 
in April, you know, some of my late blooming, like things like major came through. I had a really, uh, I hardly had any juice. I had like one tank of, of juice, and, uh, but it was really tannic and very aromatic. Uh, fencing, I think you've already heard that. Uh, it, Steve pounded that one in. Um, got to have um, deer fencing up. And then uh, doing a lot of um, uh, insect and, and disease monitoring. So, and I participate in the uh, Wisconsin Department of Ag looks for growers to set up monitoring traps. So I participate in that program and really like it because it also makes me uh, read my traps every week and, and report on them. So even if the insect pest isn't of concern to me, because most of the minor pests I don't really worry about much, um, uh, just like leaf rollers with young trees especially, and I just try to keep the other things at bay. So I think that's about it, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, Maury Wills and I were just talking about that out in the hallway. Uh, no, I, I need a good program for that. I've seen it mostly in that crone bush thing that I, I have from the wild apple tree in Minnesota. Um, I haven't had I haven't had things too bad except for on that on that tree so far. I I do a lot of copper sprays, but apparently copper doesn't do much for um, for cedar apple rust. So I'm looking looking for more answers on that. And apparently, uh, yes. Well, I mean, I mean, Liberty just uh, just is a very grower grower friendly tree. So, um, and the and the Priscilla Priscilla is kind of hard to find, um, but that is in the Tremlets uh, cider that you drank. The base apple in that is is Priscilla. So that's about eighty percent Priscilla, and just twenty percent tannic apple because that. That uh, and, and, and that's what's really fun about working with these different blends. I mean, when we first blended those two apples, I just had a hunch that those two would go together, that the flavor profiles would complement. I'm not a winemaker, but I, I know a good winemaker will know how to take a juice profile and envision what kind of wine or cider can come out of that. And so um, those, those two have just been a real happy marriage for us. The juice profiles match. We do see as the trees mature, the, um, I think the tannin profiles are maturing as well, other aspects about the tree. And then also we do get a vintage effect. So that one, for example, is a little sweeter than our first and our third release of it, just because it was the apple juice was so acidic that year that we just had to blend a little sugar to balance that balance that tartness. And going forward, we'll be trying to do, do more of our own uh, juice. We just haven't had a, a good way to freeze our, um, our apple juice. So 